So welcome to our today's um, real estate panel on successful cross-border partnerships, how to make it happen. I'm Yan Liu, first year student here at UCI Anderson. And along with me we have Yuan Wu, sophomore, uh, major in chemical engineering, and also Dong Bo Yao, a senior major in statistics. We are the student directors of this panel. Um, built by the need for capital diversification and risk mitigation, China has made the U.S. real estate market a top destination for overseas investment. Initially concentrating on income producing properties, Chinese investors are now seeking a full spectrum of opportunities, including ground up development, often with a developed partner. Today our panelists will examine the anatomy and evolution of a cross-border development partnership and share insights into issues that matter to both sides in the partner building process. Uh, Yuan will help introduce our speakers. We're very delighted to welcome the following speakers to our panel today. First of all, Mr. David Fang, founding partner at Redbridge Capital. Mr. Chen Liu, executive vice president and chief lending officer at Cathy Bank. Mr. Bill Zhou, co-founder and managing partner at the Elite International Investment Fund. Last but not least, we have Ms. Megan Maloney, senior development manager at the El 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 um, the Rockbridge Company. This panel will be moderated by Mr. Greg Khan, a partner at Cox, Castle and Nicholson, one of the largest real estate law firms in the country, where he manages the firm's Pacific Rim Group and has been recognized for his creative, effective and efficient approach. For over 30 years, international investors, lenders and developers from Greater China and Asia have depended on Mr. Khan's highly sophisticated real estate acquisitions and finance, construction and development, and entity structure and joint venture negotiation. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and panelists. I've been uh, uh, working in the Pacific Rim Arena for about 25 years. Um, and preparing for this program, um, I, I recall oh, about 12 years ago or so, walking into a meeting with, uh, uh, I, had, I had, my client was a, a Chinese investor, was not present, we were, I was heading to a meeting with the, with the developer partner to go talk to the seller of our target property. And as we were about to walk into the meeting room, uh, the, the partner turned around to me and said, whatever you do, don't, don't tell them that my capital partner is from China. And, you know, let's fast forward about eight years later, maybe 2012, 2013, I would go to the same sorts of meetings and, and pretty much all the development partners would brag that their capital partner was, was from China. So, you know, a lot changed in those eight years. And uh, a lot of those changes are manifested in the way uh, these groups approach cross-border partnerships and alliances. And that's what we're talking about today, the anatomy of a successful cross-border partnership, how to make them, the challenges, the benefits. But today with this panel, we're going to draw upon um, the viewpoints, the insights of the partners themselves. So again, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, to my left, Bill Zo is, is co-founder and managing partner of Elite International Investments. And Elite is a, a privately owned real estate investment company. And he established it in 2013. He makes equity investments in value-added opportunistic strategies through working with the best local talent sponsors he can find. So Bill, since 2013, has invested close to half a billion dollars of equity into over a billion and a half dollars of projects all over the country. All of these invest investments were done through cross-border partnerships. Bill's U.S. development partners include LNR, Mill Creek, and Wood Partners. But earlier this year, Bill and the Rakovich company, Megan's company, entered into a partnership on a project called the Alhambra. The Alhambra is a 45-acre, million-square-foot mixed-use development spread over 11 buildings in a campus setting in Alhambra. Uh, Megan oversees the, uh, uh, actually Megan oversees the entire project, capital improvements, financing, marketing, leasing, and new development. And new development in this project includes 
18 acres that are currently being entitled for residential. So as I said, Rakovich formed a joint venture with Elite and, and another group called Futureland. I think we have a few folks from Futureland in the audience, right? There we are. And, and so another partner. Um, and together they are now owning and developing the residential portion of, of the Alhambra. Um, I'm going to skip uh, beyond Chang Lu for a moment to David Fong. And uh, uh, David from Redbridge, Redbridge, Redbridge Capital is a real estate you know, investor focused on the student housing sector. Um, Redbridge owns the Shrine Collection. Um, my son was going to USC. Sorry. Um, <laughs> he lived at the Shrine Collection, so now I know. Now I know. He, we never had to call you. Um, and that's what, um, he played his red outside. Yeah, he played his red outside, so you never had to call him. So that, that was a, uh, it's a large student housing project, multiple buildings right by USC. And he's currently developing the village, which is a 215 unit, 600 plus bed ground student housing community at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. David's partner on that is Futurely. <laughs> so again, you know, I, I, I wanted to highlight the, the, the six degrees of separation along this panel. And then lastly, Chang Lu, um, Chang Lu is executive vice president in charge of commercial real estate lending over at Cathay Bank. I've known Chang for a long, long time. He is, for me, he is just a guru of, of commercial real estate lending in, in Southern California. But he has been with several Asian-based banks, Cathay is the latest, but he has been with Fuji Bank. I, when I met Chang, I think he was with Sumitomo Bank. And so, Chang has a lot of experience lending to cross-border partnerships, dealing with a lot of the issues that lenders, that, that those partnerships present to lenders, and coming up with, with resolutions. So, with this as the background, let, let's talk about cross-border partnerships. And, and what, what we'd like to do is, rather than have people come up and, and, and make a presentation, is really just have a conversation. And, and my job is easy, I'm just going to ask the questions. Um, but let me start with Megan and Bill and ask them, what, when, you, when you guys went looking out for, for partners, and I know that Bill, you, you started, Megan, this is Matt Rakovich's first cross-border partnership. Bill, this might be your dozen, your twelfth cross-border partnership. When, when you came to look for a partner, or when, when, when you decided that this was what you were going to do, what were the criteria that you were looking for in a partner, in a, in a U.S. partner? Um, first of all, you know, when we come to U.S. to make investment, you know, we, we know this is a, a, a different market than China. You know, the business logic is a different and the, the track record is a, extremely important here. So, uh, when we uh, uh, look for a partners, so typically we, we will look at the track record, we will uh, talk with the the top management teams, you know, some of our um, partners, you know, have a, um, have a nationwide, you know, footprint, like the Minari is a public company, and, and New Creek and the uh, food partners, they all national, uh, leading U.S. Uh, developers. So, we, you know, when we want to, uh, 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 you know, start a partnership instead of diving into a specific deal and uh, just uh, doing one-off deal we want to do a programmatic uh, you know, relationship so we can do repeat deals multiple deals and uh, from uh, from an operation perspective it's much more efficient the cost of the capital is lower the, you know uh, the uh, cost to prepare the the you know, term sheet and joint venture agreements are much lower, and you can have a, you can have a, a very stable you know uh, pool of uh, deals that uh, you can look into. So that's our uh, uh, a starting point. So when we start, you know, we look at the national platform. That's you know uh, when we first start. But uh, we are not just looking for uh, the size or uh, or uh, or uh, the brand name. So so to speak, you know, because uh, uh, you have to know the right partners. We talk with uh, basically top 
uh, pretty much top 20 uh, uh, top US developers. And uh, I know each of them, their strengths, their weakness, not only at the corporate level, but also at the each individual team. Their you know, Northeast team versus their Southeast team. What's uh, the local partner's capability. So, so that's a, that's a, a pretty lengthy process. And uh, when we start off, the first deal we didn't, you know, have the luxury to do that. But gradually we uh, build a, 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 you know, pretty methodical way to choose, you know, our partner. And uh, in this specific case, you know, in case you you guys don't know Rockledge, you know, company well, I just have to. Advertise for them a little bit. You know, Wayne Rockledge is called Mr. LA. You know, he's a he's the LA guy. He did you know Google's you know office in LA, converting a, a hangar into a, a creative office, a very creative uh, project in you know, the block. Uh, it's, it's the largest renovation project in LA, and he uh, they have an impactful you know uh, track record. You know, so that's that's the starting point. So, based on that, we triangulate with the different uh, you know uh, information we have, and that's that's how we look into uh, 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 choosing our partner. Yeah. And, and, and let me just stay with you for a moment. What what was it you wanted? I mean, uh, an investor here might say my uh, my goal is to, to to make the best return I can, and and of course, uh, you know that's that's one of your goals. But what what were you, what was your motivation? Uh, I, I, the motivation is uh, um, uh, we can deploy a meaningful amount of capital in a risk controlled way. You know the uh, the quality of work has to be consistent across different teams. You know, and the, the size of the deal we can look into. You know, has to be uh, big enough, so we don't have to. You know, talk with 20, 30 partners. You know, negotiate each time a new term sheet, a new uh, joint venture agreement, and uh, you know, do the due diligence on, on each you know partners. Uh, because uh, we, uh, to be frankly, we're still a very small uh, company. We we have very limited resources. So in that sense, you know, we're not uh, we cannot afford you know to underwrite. 20, 30 partners. We can only underwrite, you know, probably four, five, six partners, and but do repeat deals. So we we, 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 we are looking at the, the potential deal size, and we are looking at the track record. And the U.S. real estate market is uh, always uh, a cycle. You know, have a cycle. You know, up cycle and down cycle. You know, everybody can make money on the up cycle. You know. That's easy, but uh, the reputation of uh, our sp uh, a sponsor, our you know, partner, to be able to work uh, together with the equity partner, to work together with the bank, you know, go through the uh, really hard time and solve the problem. That's a very important uh, part for us, you know, to to understand that, you know uh, our partner uh, will be able to go. Uh, Goes through up and downs, you know, with us together. You know. Megan, I'm going to give you a chance now. Um, I mean, Rakovich's partners in, 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 on before Bill at Elite was uh, with AIG, so you're used to getting a different kind of capital. Yeah. Um, tell me about what what brought you to consider. Brought you to consider uh, uh, working with a, a Chinese investor on, on this project. Sure. So the Alhambra, just as Greg said earlier, it's a earlier it's a 45 acre campus. We've got retail office and then future development on the land. So it's an institutional grade project. Um, historically, has we've had the institutional partners and um, just finished a 10 year partnership with AIG. So. When we were, um, you know, going out to market and meeting with future partners, um, I think Elite's background and same with Futureland's background on the residential side, which we have not done a lot of residential, became a very, very good partnership where we operate the office in retail. We've done it at the Alhambra. We've held for almost 20 years now. Um, this is our fourth partnership on that project. Um, so we are very familiar with it, um, and then going forward on the development for the residential, 
here we have two partners that are very well versed on the residential side. So it was a very, very strong synergy between the two. Um, a lot of, again, relationship based. I think we very much had common ground, common thoughts on how we wanted to go about everything and that really provided a level of trust that we needed to get the deal done and to move forward. So we are very happy about it. David, uh, uh, your project in, uh, at UNLV and your partnership is a little bit different. Um, Redbridge is a future institution, institutional sized uh, developer, but right now, not, not quite. Yeah, we, we approach it a little differently. Um, we, we actually look for partners. We're coming more from a strategy standpoint. Um, we particularly like the student housing space because we think it's a good investment class. And one of the things that when we were forming the business, what we liked about it, we also see the sort of the trends in education, and UCLA is a good example too, just like USC, where we saw this growth in enrollment from foreign students. And, the, the, you know, and, and a lot of the foreign students are, are fairly wealthy, and so, and so they, they, they can pay a fair amount of rent, which we liked. And so uh, our strip, and then the other aspect when we were looking for capital partners, we were trying to figure out what's the most efficient kind of capital we can get, and also one where we can develop long-term relationships. And when we looked at the market, we also saw there's this, as, as everyone knows, you know, from all the news and articles, there's all this Chinese capital and, and Asian capital too, because we, we talked to Korean and Japanese investors too. There's a lot of Asian capital that's looking to come, come west. And one of the areas where we thought the strategy was very attractive to them, but we thought we could develop very deep relations was, was specifically in student housing. You know, it was an asset class that um, a lot of foreign investors are just comfortable with. Because um, you know, everyone knows what universities and colleges are about. And, um, and most, especially Chinese investors, they know USC, they know UC Berkeley, they know UCLA. And so, um, and, and then when you look at the strategy, especially, you know, a lot of what we do we're primarily focused on sort of converting or, or upgrading assets and doing what we call value-add investing. And so, by, you know, basically to, to renovate and improve operations and management, um, we generate revenue and, and higher returns. And so, um, a lot of the Chinese investors in the past, most of them were focused on condo-type developments. And so, we thought this was sort of a way to differentiate ourselves in a, in a space where, um, you know, we could kind of stand out. And so, you know, obviously, in the condo and the for sale market, you've got huge guys like L&R and Wood. And so for us, you know, and we started out as a, as a, as a group. We're, 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 we form three partners, and basically, one is an investment fund management professional who used to invest money for U.S. pensions in Asia, and now and, and joint venture in China, Japan, and Korea with a lot of um, foreign developers and, and investment groups. And now that money's coming here, and then my other partner, uh, founding partner, is a student housing specialist and apartment specialist. And his family office has a few thousand apartments and, and student housing beds. And so we saw this as a good opportunity to sort of take advantage of the market trends. So, so let me ask, uh, uh, the typical, typical uh, uh, joint venture arrangement that, that, that I see, capital partner is putting up the capital, the development partner, is providing all the local expertise. When the financing comes, the, maybe the development partner negotiates with the lender, and then the capital partner signs all the guarantees. Um, is that how your deal works? Let me, uh, Bill, Megan, it's you. Were you, yeah, were you sure. Is that pretty much how it works? Uh, <clears throat> more or less. Mm, more or less, you know, the difference uh, is, um, uh, uh, foreign capital typically do not have a lot of onshore liquidity. You know, if uh, 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 a U.S. Uh, equity coming in, sometimes you will see the deal that U.S. equity will share the guarantees or backstop the guarantees. And uh, uh, of course, there's a uh, you know cases that you know sponsor take all the guarantees, but uh, in uh, in uh, 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 foreign capital, including Chinese capital uh, uh, joint venture, you were less likely to see uh, the equity, you know, uh, taking on a guarantee. And uh, typically, uh, you know, the sponsor, like a Rockledge company, will uh, provide a guarantee to the bank. 
And, and David, in your in your adventure, is, is that were you the are you the guarantor? We're, we're, we're primarily the guarantors. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so then let me ask, how do you, how do you guys how do you get comfortable? I mean, I, what Bill just described was we're a large entity with asset with no real liquidity or assets in the U.S. So. You have a, you know, you're you're negotiating, you know, a, a big transaction and, and a big financial commitment from a, a partner that you cannot, that if they if they don't perform, you, there's nothing you can really do. You can't go reach those assets there on the team. How did how did you get comfortable? Um, like I said earlier, a lot of it I think was based on trust. You know, we established that there was a lot of vetting through the process, I think on both sides, obviously, to um, understand Elite and same with Futureland. Obviously, these are companies that we've never done business with before. So really talking to um, groups that we've done business with on our brokerage and lending side and getting comfortable that way and understanding the, the as much as you were looking at our reputation, the same, the same for you guys. Um, and really getting comfortable with that, obviously, the the financial guarantees and everything that had to be in place and as a developer we're fairly used to having to provide that guarantee and being a sponsor on that on that side of things but I think a lot of it you know as we didn't know much about each other it was just a lot of getting to know and and talking to people and getting comfortable with and then obviously going through the whole process and all it was it was helpful that they had done other deals here before you? Yes, definitely, yeah. yeah. Gave us a lot of, um, and I think with our brokerage team too, they've done a lot of deals with Elite and FutureLink, so um, really providing that that information to us obviously was helpful. And David, you, you have the, yeah, have the no, same I, concerns, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, I mean, we're, we're a small company in Rakovich, but I mean, trust and, and screening and, and you know, we, we, we've talked to the whole range of different types of foreign investors from, you know, individual high net worth people who are worth over $100 million from China or Korea to, you know, sovereign wealth funds even from Asia. And so everyone's a little different. Everyone gets, you know, you, you, you have to rely on the lawyers and, and bankers and other people because, people, you know, you get introduced to people. That's, you know, real estate is a very relationship driven business. And so you, you start off with that through the introductions and the trust that you have from, from those relationships. But then a lot of it also is, is and we've developed sort of little tests, to, for, for at least for our firm, over the years. You know, with, you know and, and, and just as an example, like in our USC deal, um, that was an existing asset, uh, we partnered with a, it's actually the chairman of a, of a very major Chinese corporation um, who has actually three publicly New York Stock Exchange listed companies, billionaire type guy. And so um, we were introduced to him through, through some friends. But since this was his first investment in the US, you know, we were a little weary. And, and part of that weariness comes from experience, because we've also had experiences where, as an example, you know, we, we dealt with, I'm you know, just making up a city, say like the biggest developer at Nanjing or something. And we've chased deals with them. And we get down to, you know, we're about to close, and then they renegotiate. <laughs> or all of a sudden, they have a hard time getting their money into the country. And it causes a lot of heartache for us. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've learned those lessons. It's one of the kind of little tricks we do sometimes. Um, again, it depends on, on, the, on the parties. We didn't do this with Futureland. Um, we, we require deposits. And so one of the things we did at our SC deal was we actually had the foreign partner fund their money in, and they fund their money into ESTA. So, and it was also very unusual from the Western standpoint because normally as a buyer, when you buy assets, you just fund your deposits, nothing, nothing more. And we funded like an extra $10 million. <laughs> and so the, the seller was kind of staring at this money, <laughs> even though they can't touch it because we, we have a close and they're wondering, what, what are you doing? And we were doing it because we wanted to make certain that we didn't get renegotiated because we've learned some of those hard lessons working with foreign capital. And then you, you know, and then you develop the trust, obviously, to, you know, to, and in our mindset also, if someone's willing to fund that much money up front, you know, most likely they're not going to you know, break a contract. I mean, we obviously had contracts. I'm not, just a full disclosure, I'm a lawyer by background. <laughs> so, so we have good contracts, but at the same time, a lot of times, especially foreign investors, they don't, like as Greg mentioned, their assets are in the U.S. I, it's really hard for me to really to, 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 to go back and recoup my money. And, and so, 
Um, you, you come up with little tests like that. The, you know, another little test that we, we like to look at is, you know, as, as, as um, Bill mentioned, you know, have they done deals in, in, in the U.S. before? You know, how many deals have they closed? And who they hire as lawyers and other consultants? Are they comfortable with, you know, the process in real estate deals where you do due diligence and you do sort of an analysis? And, and we've come across a lot of guys you know, who aren't familiar with that. And those guys we get a little nervous of because, you know, there's, there's some of those guys that come up and say, no, we don't need to investigate. We'll just, you know, we like it. It looks good. We visit it and let's invest in it. And you get nervous because, well, no, no, I want you to really kind of look at it and study it. Or I want you to hire a lawyer. I want you to hire certain consultants. Because the fact that they're willing to do that shows us that there's some serious commitment. To, to really invest in a foreign country. And, it, and, it's, and we're talking about Chinese, but it could be any foreign investor. It could be That's someone right. from the Middle East, it could be someone you know, from Australia or wherever it is. You know, part of the test for us is, you know, are they willing to understand and act in accordance with sort of what <coughs> local people need to do? It's hard enough to close deals, and we work with, with regular U.S. investors too. It's hard enough to close complicated deals with U.S. investors. It's even more hard, complicated and harder to do with someone who's not familiar with the culture who may not who feel that they need to do it that way. <coughs> Chang. Oh. I have a, just a point of clarification. Um, I've dealt with consumer products before, and usually when we've dealt with China, we have to get the project bonded. Right? If their bank is going to guarantee the money, um, is there something similar in, in these construction projects where, because um, I'm looking at the, the bank with the cafe, and so you, the guarantor is the local developer, uh, ultimately, it sounds like it's not Bank of China or China Construction Bank if the project goes south. So, where's the guarantee? That was almost my question. <laughs> which is, how do you, how do you uh, cope with this? You're the biggest slice of capital in the deal. Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, so, this is kind of interesting. I, I heard a lot of my panelists say, trust due diligence, right? And that's what they rely on. But for us, on the finance side, we really look at black and white. We really look at numbers, um, and and what it comes down to is the capital the capital partners from China and the local developers. The earlier question was about the guarantee, and I was kind of chuckling, or if you saw me, I was kind of smiling because it has to do with with the willingness of both partners, right? If you have a 90 10 percent split, you know the, the 10 percent partner local developer is he going to he or she going to step up to the guarantee? Not likely. Right, and then if you got that 90% equity partner from China, it depends on what their business model is. Um, a lot of them would just have um, development projects going on, multiple of them, at different cities throughout the U.S. San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and they're all kind of just halfway up or just coming out of the ground. You don't really have any stabilized properties. There's real no, there, there's no recurring cash flow. There's no recurring cash flow. There's no true equity other than development equity. As a banker, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I, it's, it's hard for us to look at a foreign entity guarantee with either A, limited assets, or assets that are just purely land, or assets that are midstream development. Now, if you got assets in another country. <laughs> um, sorry, I can't go collecting in another country unless you can. <laughs> uh, we, we've tried that before. We've gotten guarantees for with Taiwan-based companies, China-based com companies, and um, and but it's, it's, it's really not that collective. So it's not, that's, that's an issue. So really it comes down to hard assets in the US, what they really are, what they consist of from the equity partner side that are here in China, who are operating here in China, and versus, and we kind of look at that and balance it with the local developers and, and whether or not, if A, they're guaranteeing, and what's on their balance sheet. Oh, sorry, but um, on the bonding question, um, it, it comes down to vetting, for us as a construction lender, vetting the local developers and their experience and what type of projects they've done. Um, if you're talking to a Rakovich company that's done multiple sizes of sort of mega projects, yeah, then, and they're dealing with top-notch contractors, you can probably have some faith in that. But if it's a tiny little guy that's been doing nothing but 10, 20 units single family or, or sort of the multifamily stuff, all of a sudden now they want to do a, you know, uh, 200 unit uh, ground up condo project in Beverly Hills, and they're dealing with a contractor we never heard of, then yeah, we definitely want to look at the com completion guarantee as well as the completion bond. Do, do, would a lender consider, I mean, 
liability is joint and several. But would you consider several but not joint liability to help uh, with, with some of these issues? We would consider that. Um, it, it's typically it's joint and several, as you say, and you know, and, and if Greg was representing us, he would slap my hand and tell me, "Don't go walk away from joint and several." Yeah, but what just what do you think? Do you think? Sure. <laughs> you know, if I pick up the phone and call you and say, "Hey, we're considering several guarantees with two different companies," you would you would laugh at me and say, "You know, I've known you for thirty years. Why are you doing this?" Right. So, um, but right. Um, depends on the situation and depends on, I would say, the financial capacity of both partners and. How do we get comfortable? And we have to look at it and say, okay, if we can only collect, or if we have to enforce collection after one partner, are we comfortable with that? So another area, I mean, I like to talk about money and control in partnerships. So let's talk about control, how decisions are made. Um, again, uh, de depending upon the partner and how extreme uh, uh, they can be. Some development partners say, my job is pretty much to do everything except write the check. And, and your job is to write the check, right? Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of uh, uh, investors from China, especially uh, who are getting into development, are, are actually developers themselves in China. And they, they, they have some know-how. They're not doing this to, to sit in the back of the car. Um, they, they, they are, there may be some te techniques, technology, experience that they're looking to gain uh, by doing it. So how do you guys deal with, I guess, with, with how decisions are made? So we have obviously our development agreement, our JV agreement, um, and then we're, we're the managing member of the project. So um, specifically on the Alhambra, we've been involved with the project for so long. Um, we have a budget that on the, this is on the existing product. Um, we have a budget. There is parameters set in place by the operating, by the management agreement and, um, and the development agreement. And so that kind of takes care of all of that. It's all on paper. Everybody knows what it is, black and white. There's no questions. Obviously, things pop up um, over the course of time. You may have a project come up that was unbudgeted for a new, a new sizable lease, and you have to go through approvals. But um, mo mostly and most often, you want everything in writing. Everybody knows what it is at the start. There's no, no, con no confusion on anything, and that alleviates any problems in the future. So you try and get things either uh, approved budget or approved parameters for leasing or management as much of the, the decision making agreed upon and approved in advance as you can. Certainly. And it's just those speed bumps that you, uh, that you get this morning. And the same goes for the lender. You know, the lender always wants to see a budget ahead of time. They want to know, you know, what the outlay of cash is and everything else. And so they have the same parameters too on, on their side. And so making sure that everybody's in agreement, it sets you straight from the start and lays the groundwork for moving forward. And you deal with things that may come up that are unexpected and you deal with that accordingly. And let me ask, and really I'm going to ask everybody to, to, uh, to give me how they've dealt with it. I mean, typically you'll have a, 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 a Rakovich, for example, would be handling day-to-day -day management, running the leasing, running the property management, running the operations of the property. And then there'll be a, a, a list of what we might call more material or major decisions that the elite will say, you need us to approve these major decisions. You can't do them without us. Um, part of the problem I find, and, and, and I don't mean to pick on just this partnership, David, this is for, for you as well. Part of the issue there is, is that a lot of times what, what I worry about as the lawyer creating the, those decision lists is, is that you create impasse. You, you create a situation where, where the operator says we really need to do this, the capital partner says, no, I'm, I'm not going to agree to it. And what you have is just, you're moving without a direction. You're just saying, okay, then we're, we won't do anything. And we'll just sort of, and I, and I wonder whether that's, whether that's better than, than a, 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 you know, than having fewer major decisions. But, but I'm just wondering how, I mean, part of it is, is, is your trust issue. 
David, is there, do you, do you, are there mechanisms that, that, that you have in your agreement that, that uh, deal with deadlock? I guess that's what we're calling deadlock. Yeah, I mean, what we have is pretty much sort of the standard provisions where, you know, our, our majority equity partner, it's, they don't have an override, right? But basically on certain key decisions, everyone has to agree. And, and you're right, it, it creates the potential for us to have a deadlock. And the typical way we resolve that is, it, it, is you have to, if you really can't agree, and it's material, and you set up some parameters to, to try to solve some solutions, because we try to agree, as, as Megan said, we agree as much as we can. Upon. So we'll agree on the budget, and we'll agree on the business plan, especially for us when we're doing renovation, or we, have, we always have a strategy for something we're doing, or if we're doing ground up, obviously we know what we're building. And so you try to create, and maybe the part of this comes from my lawyer background, you try to create as much parameters, as much as you can agree upon as you can, and then to the extent that you're just using the budget as an issue, if, if you approve an item, but you, you're kind of stuck, but they, there, there's, a, there's a little, uh, what I call, float or contingency where you, can, you know, as long as it's not, not over X percent, okay, you can go settle that and then you'll resolve it later. So there's, because the last thing you want, especially during construction, is to stop construction. <laughs> and so then things will come up in construction where you always have to, to, to um, you know, make decisions about different things. That's just kind of funny. In fact, that you know, we just had a construction meeting on Wednesday in Las Vegas, and we're going over the process and approvals and stuff. And the, uh, the contractor showed me, okay, here's a list of over 300 things I want you to look at, including like when I put in the concrete, make sure I'm using the right concrete, or this, or, you know, or this color, or whatever type of wood. And, and you know, and then yeah, I know there are some partners who don't care about that. They really more care about the end product. They want to see the finishes. They want to see. Sort of, the, they want to be more involved in, in, in the end process. And part of it also is, they part of the partnership as an operating partner, our our value, what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be guiding that decisions and making most of those decisions. And so, from from my standpoint, we try to obviously get as much flexibility as we can, and build up as much as we can. I think flexibility is key. Yeah. But you have to have trust though, because there are times where we do disagree on something, you know, and and then it's just a matter of. You know, it's, it, you know, I look at partnerships because it's like a marriage. You, you got to be able to get along, <laughs> or roommates, let's say, you <laughs> student housing. And so if you don't get along, it's going to be a very, long, you know, unhappy <laughs> long journey together because you're going to be stuck together for a while. Because at the end of the day, typically what we have with these contracts, you ultimately, if you can't agree and there's a deadlock, you have the ability to buy each other out. And that's, no one really wants that because usually when that happens, you're not going to, you know, you're going to, you know, someone's going to take a loss. Everyone's going to share some kind of loss. Um, Bill, you've done a number of uh, partnerships with a number of different partners, and they all have their different motivations. Some of them are looking to build a building and, and reap the profits immediately. Some, like Rafferich, can be a longer-term holder with you, a longer-term partner. Um, in terms of the, uh, that, the exit or the end of the partnership, um, how do how do you look at it as a as a foreign investor? Are you are you, are you do you want to control the exit strategy? Do you want to be able to buy the asset once it's it's all done, or or is that not an issue for you? Uh, oh, we we definitely want to have that option. You know whether or not we want to buy it. Uh, you know it uh, really depends on a lot of the things. You know you, uh, uh, for the most part, it really depends on how we invest or what it, at the end of the day what they. Uh, what to do with their money, you know, uh, do they want to redeploy in the same strategy or do they want to you know, have a lower rate, a longer term, you know, investment. So, so in the uh, contract, uh, typically we have this uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, flexibility, you know, so, so you know. But, uh, but you always try and negotiate a purchase right of some sort for your... Uh, for some, your some sort of an option or some sort of, you know, exit, you know, strategy. At, at the end of the day, you know, uh, when we come to those situations, rarely you pull out a contract and tell the you know investor on um, item five point six and it says well, so and so. It's a, you know it doesn't work. It's a, mainly you know uh, between you and your partner sit down together you know and talk about the business. You know once you uh, 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 you know get to a point, you have to pull out the contract out of a drawer, and uh, that that's typically uh, you know uh, that's a real bad start. No, so um, it's a, it's a, there's a legal aspect of that, 
and they want to, you know, as negotiate mm -hmm. as a favorable term as possible. And there's a, you know, a, a real business aspect of that is, uh, you know, building the rapport, building the relationship, we want to do a next deal with, you know, this partner, and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. That really drives, you know, most part of the negotiation, not the legal part. Well, because the, the push-pull on these issues is, you know, one partner says, I want the right of first offer, the right of first refusal, the, the right to buy this before you market it or, or as you market it. Now, the other partner might say, well, but that's going to, that might chill the ability to market it. I mean, if I have to tell the public, you know, this is, you make, you make your offer and then I have to, to subject it to a right of first refusal and see if my partner will match it, you know, some, some people might think, well, that'll, some people will say, I, I, I'm not interested if, I, if, I'm, if I'm just a yeah, stocking just, horse. Just give you an example, you know, I, I heard, you know, uh, 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 some of our partners are talking about the other equities, you know, in a way that, you know, equities make operating decision that try to depress the, the current, you know, income of the company so they can get a, a better buyout buy of price, price <laughs> and then readjust, you know, price afterward. So if you have a partner, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if this is a truly, they can prove that, but if they, this is true, and, uh, and the partner say to you that, like that, just think about, you know, whether or not they want to do a next deal, a good deal with you, you know, when you think that they try to take some advantage of your partner. So, so it has to be a fair deal, you know, uh, in the long run, so that you can do that, can, uh, you know, a, a, a long-term recurring relationship. Well, you guys are, are I'm, let me put it differently, I mean, Futureland is a huge company. Redbridge is an emerging company. I mean, are, do you worry about that imbalance in size when you talk about some of these exit strategies or mechanisms? Do you worry about that at all? I mean, we think about it, but I think... Worry is the wrong word. word. Worry is the wrong word. It's, but again, it all goes back to, it's a relationship, right? right. We, we have to trust them. We have to get along with them. You know, we're going to disagree on some things, and, and then hopefully, you know, that's part of the calculus. Of, you know, we're, we're not, at least I, I try not to think that when we enter into these partnerships, we're just doing it just because they're, they're the guys with the money. You know, we, we do it because we think about a number of factors. You know, can we get along with them? We'll, we'll, we'll you know, who's their team? And it's part of that process that Bill talked about, the due diligence and making sure you're comfortable with them. Um, but, and also, but forget what the documents say. The practi practical reality, too, is as an operating partner, we, we know the most about the property. Sure. And, and, and we have the most knowledge. Of, and and if, if, if one partner really wants to get out, but the other one wants to stay in, you can have discussions and you can work things out where I think in my opinion, both parties' objectives are met. We can bring in another equity partner, and we can make sure that the, the exiting partner is, is happy with their price. So I think it's stuff. I think it, these are things again. It's, it's all relationships that, that can work out. You you kind of pick and like a marriage, or as I said, like roommates. You pick and choose your fights. You know, you're not going to have a perfect roommate or, or, or spouse. Cheng, I, I asked you to weigh in on when we were talking about capital. How about control? I mean, how will the bank look at a at, at a at a management uh, provision in, in a partnership agreement where lots of decisions, maybe, or ma major decisions require unanimity. Is that a problem for you? Is that a, how, how does a bank worry about these control issues? Um, quite, on, quite honestly, we, um, we look at it, but it's not the driving factor. Uh, if there is a partner's dispute, we don't want to be in the middle of it. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm staying as far away as possible. The only thing I'm going to say is if that dispute causes the construction to stop or to slow, where you're behind schedule, or you know, if, this, if the project stopped, then, then we have some leverage with the loan documents, and that leverage may push the partners to resolve the differences, right? Because if we say, hey, we got to stop funding, and, and we are going to stop funding, and you know, we're, we're going to call even a default. Right, somebody's got to come to the table and resolve that issue. Let me. We want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but let me ask one more question, and and, and anybody who wants to ask a question, including Andrea here. Um, how will you? How? What is? What will? It, what is success in this? In, in these partnerships? Megan, Bill, you're branded. Bill, you have some experience with our partners, but 
at the end of the day, is there just an IRR, or is there something more or else in addition that, that will define success for, for this partnership? I, I, I think that, uh, uh, for sure, economic is uh, you know uh, an important part of that. And don't be like a losing deal. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, also, you know, uh, the other measure I, I think is uh, you're willing to do uh, another deal. Mm -hmm. You know, with the partner. You know, uh, you're willing to go through you know uh, this process again and again and uh, so so that's that's just an indication of uh, you know. Uh, you have a run successful project, you know, and then you want to like, repeat that. Yeah, and I think also, uh, you know, we do a lot of projects over time. On the Alhambra, this is our fourth partnership now. And, and, um, on the Alhambra? Yeah, on the Alhambra. And, um, yeah, you want to be able to obviously work well together, come up with a successful project, make it work, um, obviously, or hopefully exceed what your uh, balance sheet may show, but um, looking forward to do other deals together. And there's, you have to always look to the future. You can't just look at the present. And obviously, that's what's in front of you, but looking to the future, looking who your people are, because if you find a partnership that works really well together, you get you find success together, and, and you can move through and do you know any product type. I, I, David, before I get your answer, I'm going to ask Futureland because because uh, you're in both of these deals. How will Futureland define success? And is it just a, a, a good return, or is there something more Futureland's hoping to get out of these relationships? Uh, well, well, I think the return is definitely like that's almost um, necessary for us to define success. Um, on the other hand, I think for us, uh, it's really. I bring a lot of local knowledge for us um, to enter the U.S. market. Um, so some experience and know-how. Yeah, exactly, and also um, especially like the, the entitlement we're going through for the Alhambra deal, uh, where we can really get um, better understanding of uh, the local policy and all the work. Yeah. What kind of regulation is there by local, uh, state, and federal governments on um, foreign capital coming in? Um, are they incentivizing? Are they um, discouraging? Um, you know, and, and, and you know, making it easy. I know, I know, like recently with EB five, like there's been a lot of cracking down EB five, allowing people to, you know, it's kind of been like a route for capital investments. And, um, I was wondering, being comment on that, um, and like, you know, is, is the flow of capital being like, yeah, in the future will it be restricted, especially with the administration changes and. Um, well. That's, there's a lot of questions there, but, but I, I think uh, uh, in terms of just uh, uh, the uh, restrictions on foreign capital coming into the U.S., and, and I might ask Chang to, to answer a lot of that, because a lot of uh, uh, companies, especially banks, which are the, at the front line, have KYC, know your customer rules, and uh, uh, I, I work with some foreign companies, and, uh, with, and, and they're, they're auditors. I, I can't believe they go all through everything. I mean, just not to know just about the company, but any any ten percent shareholders. I'm more than talking about governmental, not like bank, like you know, not private sector, but governmental. Like, U.S. Uh, regulations? Well, you have CFIUS, but beyond CFIUS, Bill, I don't think there are any restrictions on your ability to, to bring capital here at, 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 at the U.S. level. That's right. At the U.S. level, I, I don't think that there's a you know regulation prevent capital from investing here. But you know there's a FORPTA, you know foreign uh, investment in real estate, and there's a special tax you know uh, implemented in the A. You know at the time was you know intended to uh, uh, to um, curb the, the Japanese investment, but it's a still. Here, a lot of effort to put into uh, you know reform of FOPTA, but uh, so far there's a little bit of progress. But uh, still, uh, foreign capital to invest in real estate, uh, the uh, you know the effective tax rate is pretty high. So that I, I think that's the deterring factor, you know. But uh, uh, there's always ways, uh, and there's an exemption, you know, to uh, uh, to uh, the tax code, you know. Uh, and then, and, and CFIUS is a, is a, just if, you, if it's a 
sensitive asset. So my guess is, is that when they, they, they said in the earlier session that the Del Coronado was left out of the strategic hotels deal because it was by a naval base, that was probably a CFIUS decision. Yeah, you can't. Um, I mean, there are tax concerns, as, as you mentioned, but there's you can't really single out a country to just outright prohibit their money to come in here, unless there's another legal justification for it. So far. So far, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> national security or something. Like that. So, um, I mean, because otherwise, how do you start? Because then you start you're going down a very slippery slope. Okay, it's okay for German money to come in, but it's not okay for you know money from Iraq or wherever, you know, unless there's specific, you know, terrorist implications or other things like that. But, but there are definitely tax you know, laws and regulations, which obviously Chinese investors and other foreign investors are very concerned about. For the finance side, I think outside of your Big Secrecy Act and kind of knowing where the source of funds are coming from, I think there's there's less U.S. regulations with regards to that. There's probably more so on the China side. I mean, we are talking about cross-border in this, you know, that that session. So there's definitely a lot more regulations on that side. Eventually, that you know, they're finding loopholes and they're going to continue to find loopholes. Just a matter of time. Please. I just want to resonate with uh, what you were sharing about uh, foreign real estate investment. Uh, one of my real estate investment is uh, about 10 miles from phenomenal Vanderbilt Air Force Base, where we launch space rockets in my development of the California Space Center in Space City. Oh. And I am considering, one of the reasons I am here is because I am considering to invite Chinese capital to be a part of the experience, so there is a good collaboration between our nations, our example, statement example, that uh, we can unite uh, around something more than just tariffs, duties, exchange rates, and uh, the development is spectacular because I'm getting a for free. Is uh, because there's more risk involved in these ventures. Do the domestic uh, developers you build in a bit more margin, or do you consider this capital coming in as incremental, so you don't build in as much because it's not what you expect? It? And the same for the bank. Um, I I don't think we would look at it any differently. We just make sure there's some stronger measures in place to address those issues up front. Um, but in terms of building anything extra, um, you know, it's nothing significant. Um, Not much different than you treat no, the other three parties. No. Yeah. Um, the only thing for me on the finance side would be looking at the experience level of both the local guys and the China-based investor, equity investor, um, we will look at whether it's a higher contingency or a higher interest reserve capacity. 